in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one hand, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first hope to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Ever equipping God as I speak, may you increase and I decrease. May the words you have given me for this message be seeds that rest in our hearts, that we might bear fruit for you here on earth. May I be bold and courageous in speaking what it is you've given me to speak. And may we, as your people, have ears that hear. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. He sat on his horse, overlooking the valley. He raised his hand and he spoke in his native tongue. Sukmani tu tanka obi wasi. Sukmani tu tanka obi wasi. Sukmani tu tanka obi wasi. And he called him by name. His heart was breaking. It was a calling out. He had chosen that one. He had marked that one. And his heart was breaking. And he was calling out in love. Such passion. Such desire for one who had once been at odds with the person he was calling out to, to the person he was crying out to, calling him by name. When Paul writes this beautiful letter to the church of Ephesus, he's calling out to the people by name. He's calling them and letting them know that it is God who speaks to them. It is God who uses his servant Paul to speak to them and say to them, you are the chosen one. You are the chosen one. God chose you in the beginning of time. God created you and God formed up the heavens and the earth. And he made creation come alive. He breathed breath into the dirt. And humankind came to be. And he said, it is good. In fact, on that last day, he didn't just say, it is good. He said, it is very good. And he didn't say so much that it was very good because of what he had created. He said it is very good because of the relationship that he could create. That humankind would now walk upon all of God's creation. And humankind would be in relationship with God. Chosen. There's a popular Christian series out on TV now called Chosen. Or if you have the CDs, you can watch it on the CD. Or you can find it on um, different TV channels that you can watch. And it's the story of Jesus. It's, a, it's an interpretation of the story of Jesus. And it's quite clever. The people who wrote it, they, they kind of filled in the aspects that I've always questioned. What did Jesus act like behind the scenes? What was really said on the boat? What was it like when they really made the catch? Who was laughing at who? Who doubted who? You know? The, you know how guys trick each other and mess with each other? It's just the way we say we love one another. But any of you guys do that? Y'all mess with your friends? <laughs> Blake, do not lie in the house of God. <laughs> That's how men say we love each other. We mess with each other. You girls, I'm not going into that one. <laughs> but it's written and it's called The Chosen. And it's about the walk of the disciples with Jesus. 
And you go to this text, and that word weighs, doesn't it? God chose you. Let it sit. God chose you. Chose you. How's that feel? The creator of all the heavens and all the earth. The one who is so big we can't imagine. The one who is so encompassing in love that we can't fathom what that love looks like. Called you by name and chose you. Created all of this because God chose you. I don't know about you, but that's a lot. When I think God chose me, I'm like, I know me. I am not worthy for God to choose me. I know what I said yesterday. I know what I said when that big bass came off the hook. I know that. I did not honor the creation that made that big bass when that big bass shook his head and got off my line. And that's a little thing. Not to talk about the one who I had an argument with. Not to talk about the one who I judged. Not to talk about the one who I looked at and they didn't match what I thought they should be. Right? Right? And, but we're chosen. God chose in all of God's infinite wisdom. Why would God choose humanity? Do you know humanity? Can you answer that question? God chose us because God loves us. In spite of who we think we are, God loves us. In spite of all the differences we even see in this room, young, old, whatever, God loves us. In spite of all the tension that might sit on the pews because you don't get along with somebody else gathered in this room, God loves us. And God chose all of us. You know, that's the thing we as people of God have to understand. God didn't just choose you. God didn't just choose me. But I want you to think of that person you can't forgive. I want you to think of that person you're prejudiced against. I want you to think of that person you don't like. I want you to think of that person that wronged you. I want to think of that person that hurt you. I want you to think of that person that degraded your children. Created your children. <laughs> Sometimes you just get to preaching and it gets hot. <laughs> huh? God chose them. God chose them. Just like God chose you. Now, how's that feel? The one you can't stand? Anybody have anybody in your life you have unforgiveness for? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise your hand for you. Right? We've been wounded in our lives. And we live from that woundedness instead of living from being chosen by God. We love so that we won't ever be hurt again. Did you know that? Human beings can't fathom how God loves because we love cautiously. Because we've been hurt before by another human being who didn't love the way God loves because we all don't love the way God loves. But yet that same human being who walked on us and hurt us and broke our heart and treated us like dirt and called us names we weren't supposed to be called, cheated us out of moments we needed in life, was chosen by God. Just exactly like you and I are. As perfect as we see ourselves. As good as we see ourselves. As great as we think, yeah, maybe God didn't choose me. There are some in the world who know God chose them. They walk through this world like they're God's chosen. And God did. But why would God do that? Paul wants the church to know that no matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, wherever you are, God chose you. Paul, sitting in prison, writes and says, God chose me. God chose you. We're to be together. A community of faith. How many times we use that as a church? The community of faith. We are a, and we say this word so flippantly, family. You know, there's some families in this world I know of I do not want to be a part of. I'm serious. And do you know that that word pushes people away from the church? 
because of their family experience. So we are a community of faith. But are we a community like the outside community that segregates, that's biased, that's prejudiced, that stands on other people's heads so we can promote ourselves? The rest of the community is chosen just like we were. All the other churches in this community are chosen just like we are. We're all creations of God, and God wants us to be in relationship. God wants us to be in relationship with God. God wants us to be in relationship with Jesus. And God wants us to wear the Holy Spirit wherever we go. But this is how smart God is. My kids, who I was raising them, and they didn't get away with anything. Nothing. They, every time one of them tried something, they got caught. And you want to know why? Been there and done that. <laughs> right? And I had three sisters and a twin brother. So if I hadn't done it, they did. Right? So when I saw what was going on as a parent, I would usually intercede. And there would be punishment or there would be correction or whatever it is that's called this day. I would do the parent thing. Mary and I would do the parent thing. Because we had been there and done that. And we saw that, well, God knows humanity. God created humanity. And even though we think we can sneak things by God, even though we think we can sneak things by God, God knows. And God knows our hearts well enough that we, that the spirit God placed in us, that spirit of free will, that spirit that was demonstrated in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be kings of their own kingdom, God knew we needed redemption. So not only are we chosen, Paul says, Paul says, we are God's beloved and God chose to redeem us. God chose to redeem us. How did God choose to redeem us? By sending Jesus to earth. Flesh and blood, spirit of the great high, walking among humankind. So that we could experience what true love was and true forgiveness is. Can you, you're not only chosen. This is how good you are. You're not only chosen by God. You're redeemed. Think about it. I mean, I've just told you a little bit of my week. And the things that happened in my week. But I know I can go and I can speak to my heavenly God. Because I believe in Jesus as the Christ. And I'm forgiven. And the power that allows me to stand up here and speak the word of God is bestowed upon me because God believes in loving us. Through that forgiveness and redemption, we've been redeemed. It was predestined by God that we would be redeemed. Humanity would be in a love relationship with God, period. And God would do what God needed to do for that to happen. That's predestination. Not that your life's going to end up somewhere, some household. Every little thing. You have a brain. You have free will. God wants you to think and use it. But predestination that Paul talks about is that God wanted to have a loving relationship with humanity. And God foresaw that God would do that. And the work of the Christ caused that. We are a predestined relationship with God if we believe in the grace and freedom that's offered in Jesus Christ. We've been chosen. We've been redeemed. I have a term I use sometimes. It's called buried B.C. You know what that means? Before Christ. Any of y'all have stories before Christ? And you know, a lot of us have after the relationship, what God did in our life and how good God made us and blah, blah, blah. What about that B.C. stuff? That stuff you walked out of. That stuff you walked away from. That stuff you've given up. The way your life changed. Wait. Surely your life has changed when you encountered Jesus Christ. You're not the same person you were beforehand, right? Because if you are, you haven't been redeemed yet. Because to be redeemed means we've been taken from what we were and we're being made into what God sees for us. We don't live in our past. We live in the present so that we can move into the future for God. I listened to a discussion about wine. Now, those of you who know me, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in 30 years, but that's about addiction. But I listened to this wonderful discussion about wine. And I learned so much. Dry farms in Europe, Terry White is their leader, 
is, is their director, and they don't allow the vineyards to be irrigated. And being from the Texas Panhandle, I'm thinking, huh, you got to irrigate. I mean, now here you don't have to irrigate, but up there you got to irrigate. And he said this, we do not allow, we will not handle a wine that comes from an irrigated field. And to me, that's just backwards thinking, right? You want your plants to grow, you want them to flourish, you want them to produce the best fruit. So you water them, you nurture them, you take care of them. And here's what he said. Vines that have struggled produce the best fruit. Vines that have struggled produce the best fruit. Why would God redeem humanity? You ever had a broken marriage? God stepped in the middle and saved it? Guess what you're going to work with the rest of your life? Broken marriages. You ever been a troubled youth? God stepped in and rescued you out of your situation. Guess who you're going to be a, a voice for in the future in your life? Troubled youth. You ever had children who have addiction problems or had an addiction problem yourself? God steps in and saves you. You're redeemed from that. Guess what voice God's going to use? God's going to use your voice. God's going to use your experience. Why would God redeem us? Because God wants to be in a loving relationship with us. God wants us to know what goodness and love are all about. Not what human love and goodness is about. But what holy love and goodness is all about. And it's not the same thing. God's love is pure. God's love is honest. God's love is real. God's love is intimate. It's not fake. God's love does not abandon God's love stays till the end. God moves so that we can be redeemed, so that we can walk anew. Have you ever walked anew? Have you ever had that experience when you came face to face with the Christ? You were broken and desperate and God was there and God gave you a hand and God lifted you up. God straightened your shoulders. God stood you up. God lifted your chin. God pumped your heart. God said you will live again. That's redemption. God, stand up, child. Go out into the world and make a difference. Matthew says, go into, Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are chosen by God so that we can be redeemed by the work of Jesus Christ. The hand of God reaching down to earth. But why? So that we can go home and say, I love Jesus. We can put a fish on the back of our car. We can put a sign out in front of our house that says, read Psalms 91. No. Paul says we're sealed. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. You know, in ancient times when they wrote something, each leader had a, a stamp. And they would take and they would take that stamp and they would heat it up and put it in wax and then stick it on their lip to seal the letter so that it was it was determined that that was their word. If it was stamped with their seal, it was their word. It was their message. The leaders had that stamp. They've been sealed. The message has been sealed by the authority. You've been sealed by God. By the power of the Holy Spirit. For some, the third leg of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you're an ambassador. You're an ambassador. What does that mean? It means you're to go and to tell the world about what God's done in your life. You're to use your life to bring the glory to Jesus Christ so that other people that only you can reach, please hear me say that, other people that only you can reach can know what it means to be loved, can hear again that they've been chosen, to feel again that they've been redeemed and to be sealed themselves. That's what God asked us to do. His name was John Dunbar. He was an army scout. 
He was sent to a fort that had been abandoned. The other two people who had been there before him had been killed by the Pawnee Indians. John, John Dunbar went to his army station and was determined to make a difference. But the messengers got killed on the way back to remind them to come and supply the fort. And Dunbar ran out of supplies. But he did what only he knew how to do. He made friends with the Lakota tribe. He learned to speak their language. He learned to hunt. He learned to sit at their fires, to smoke their pipes, to practice their rituals. And pretty soon, they included him in their tribe. In the meantime, the army had said he was a deserter and he was a traitor because he was in relationship with the Sioux tribe. But the tribe chief, Ten Bears, gave John Dunbar, Dunbar, if you've seen the movie, he gave him a name. Because one night one of their scouts saw him and he was out by the fire and he was dancing with a wolf. He was chasing a wolf that kept coming up to the fire, and they called him Dances with Wolves. Sunki Manitou Tanka Obiwa Si. Dances with Wolves. And he made a relationship with this tribe, the people who were different than him, that he didn't know who they were. He didn't know their customs. He didn't know their ways. But he learned them all and they accepted him in their tribe. And eventually he married uh, an Anglo woman who had been captured as a young girl. Stands with fists was her Indian name. And the two married one another. And it came a time when Dances with Wolves had to leave the tribe because the army was pursuing him so hard that it was bringing wrath onto the tribe. And he went to Ten Bears and he said to Ten Bears, I must go. We must go. But along the way, he had made what he thought was an enemy in the tribe. It was the young man, wind in his hair, who was supposed to marry Stands with Fists until Dances with Wolves came along. They challenged each other. They didn't get along very well with each other. But that day when Dances with Wolves packed his horse, packed his pack horse, packed his bride on another horse, and began to walk out of the valley with all of the tribe watching. Wind in his hair, set on his pony, painted in warrior makeup with his spear lifted high, and he cried from his heart, Sunk me in town, sunk many to Tonka, watchy. Sunk many to Tonka, watchy. So Manitou Chanka, watch ye. Do you know you are my friend? Do you know you will always be my friend? So Manitou Chanka, Chawa, watch ye. Ambassadors. Ambassadors for love. If two people from such different worlds can come together and find relationship and honor for one another. Can we, those who are chosen, those who are redeemed, be able to walk out, go into the world, and help other people understand they too are chosen by God? Amen and amen.